In this series, we are going to discuss gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. In our typical patient, there is of course going to be sufficient gastric acid present in the stomach in order to digest food. However, there is sufficient tone in the lower esophageal sphincter in order to keep this acid from refluxing too much into the lower esophagus. In contrast, in our patients with GERD, there is a transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. This is going to allow stomach acid to reflux into the esophagus, causing esophagitis, irritation, strictures, and a variety of other complications, the most feared of which is adenocarcinoma. Long before any of these more ominous complications occur, however, patients are initially going to present with heartburn, which typically is going to occur 30 minutes to an hour and a half after a meal. This heartburn typically should improve with antacids or with proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole. The sensation of heartburn may also be worse at night as it worsens when the patient is lying down. This can be appreciated because if we have a schematic here of an esophagus and a stomach with some acid present in that stomach, if we were to flip this 90 degrees such that the patient were lying down, then ultimately that would allow some of these stomach contents to essentially make their way into the esophagus, thus causing GERD and esophageal irritation. Some patients with GERD may also complain of a globus sensation which is where the patient has a sensation of a lump or mass present in their throat. It should also be noted that GERD can be confused in some cases with coronary artery disease, as patients can also present with chest pain as a presenting symptom of GERD. And it is also important to note that GERD can present as chronic cough. As a matter of fact, the top three most common causes of chronic cough are postnasal drip, asthma, and GERD. And therefore, all these different presentations, from the heartburn, to the globus sensation, to the coronary artery disease, to the chronic cough, are all important to keep in mind when we think about our patients with potential GERD. As we mentioned previously, the underlying pathophysiology of GERD is reflux of acid from the stomach into the lower esophagus, the number one cause of which is transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Patients may also have GERD as a result of an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, gastroparesis, smoking, which has been shown to increase acid production, as well as hiatal hernias. There are also several key foods that can worsen GERD and which may be mentioned in board vignettes, including chocolate, foods that are high in fatty content, coffee, as well as alcohol. And so the presence of any of these foods or substances in board exam questions could ultimately be a tip-off that this patient is suffering from GERD. As we move now more so into the diagnosis, workup, and management of our patients with GERD, it is important to keep in mind the potential complications, as these are the reasons why we take this condition so seriously. Over time, patients with GERD can go on to develop esophageal strictures, erosive esophagitis, aspiration pneumonia, upper GI bleed, and as with many cases where chronic inflammation is on board for an extended period of time, we have the potential for both dysplasia and ultimately cancer. In this case, Barrett esophagus, as well as esophageal adenocarcinoma of the lower esophagus. In terms of the workup and management of our patients with GERD, there are a couple of key factors that are going to determine whether we proceed with empiric therapy with a proton pump inhibitor or whether we go straight to an endoscopy. If we have a patient who has symptoms which are suspicious for gastroesophageal reflux disease, then we really just need to ask two key questions to know the next step in management. We first ask, is this a male who is greater than 50 years of age with symptom duration greater than five years or a male greater than 50 years of age who has cancer risk factors such as a smoking history. We also then must ask, does this patient have any of the alarm or red flag symptoms for GERD? If the answer is no to both of these questions, then we proceed with a proton pump inhibitor trial. The patient will take this PPI once per day for eight weeks. If the symptoms resolve, then we have solved the problem right there. This patient simply had GERD 
and we were able to treat it successfully with a PPI. If symptoms persist while on a PPI once per day for eight weeks, then we should either increase the PPI to twice per day or switch to a different PPI, for example, changing omeprazole to pantoprazole. If the patient's symptoms improve at that point, then we assume that we have treated their GERD successfully and we simply continue the PPI. However, if symptoms persist, then the next best test in our management of these patients is a 24-hour pH monitoring test with impedance testing. Many of these patients ultimately will also undergo an endoscopy in order to rule out other potential causes, such as malignancy. Going back to our original questions above, if we answer yes to either of these two questions, then we should proceed immediately with an endoscopy with biopsies. If there is no evidence of esophagitis, dysplasia, or malignancy, then we should simply perform manometry testing of these patients to investigate the pressures along the length of the esophagus. And we should also perform esophageal pH monitoring with impedance testing in order to investigate whether this patient really indeed has GERD. However, if the patient has biopsies from their endoscopy which are consistent with esophagitis, then we must manage this based on the individual etiology that the patient has. We discuss this in more detail in a separate set of modules that we have on esophageal disorders. But for our purposes here, I think that knowing these key questions regarding the risk status of the patient and determining whether to go with empiric PPI therapy or immediately to an endoscopy is really the high yield pearl that you want to be able to pull from this algorithm and what is most likely to show up on your examinations. On the previous slide, we mentioned that there are certain alarm or red flag symptoms that are ultimately going to push us towards getting an endoscopy rather than proceeding with empiric PPI therapy. These alarm symptoms include new onset of symptoms at greater than 60 years of age, dysphagia, odynophagia, weight loss, persistent or recurrent vomiting, as well as signs and symptoms of a GI bleed, including hematemesis, melena, or anemia. And this is why I've included this red flag on the right-hand side of the presentation, which within it states, get an endoscopy, as whenever we see these alarm symptoms, we want to make sure that we rule out esophagitis, dysplasia, and cancer, which may extend beyond our traditional GERD and is not going to respond to PPI therapy. Therefore, bringing this all together, if we answer no to our key questions regarding the risk status of the patient, then we should simply start treating our GERD patients empirically with a proton pump inhibitor. In addition, for patients who have persistent symptoms of GERD after having a PPI trial for eight weeks, followed by doing twice a day PPI or switching to a different PPI for yet another trial, then our next best test is going to be a 24-hour pH monitor with impedance testing. And on any exam question, we should not hesitate to proceed with an endoscopy if we have a patient who is refractory to those empiric trials of proton pump inhibitors, if the patient has long-standing symptoms greater than five years duration, as in this case, we really need to be sure to rule out Barrett's esophagus or dysplasia of the esophagus, as well as esophageal adenocarcinoma. And we should also proceed with an endoscopy if we see any of the alarm symptoms that we mentioned on the previous slide. That'll do it for now in our discussion of gastroesophageal reflux disease, and I would once again like to show you this slide and re-emphasize how important it is to ask these questions when we have a patient on examination questions with symptoms suspicious for GERD. If we answer no to both of these key questions, then we are ultimately going to go down the road of empiric PPI therapy. However, if we answer yes to either of these key questions, then we really need to be sure to get an endoscopy with biopsies in order to rule out esophagitis, dysplasia, and cancer. This is Boards MD, and this is GERD.